Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the RC Industry Podcast. Uh, for those of you new to the show, this is the uh, podcast where I interview influential people from the world of stand-up, comedy, writing, TV, radio, uh, and find out what they do, how they do it, why they do it, how they got into it, and everything in between. Today's guest is David Quantic. He's a writer who has written things for TV shows such as Spitting Image, uh, as well as uh, radio programs like On The Hour and the follow-up television program The Day Today. He's also been a journalist for magazines such as The NME. He's written several books that are autobiographies for comedians and musicians, as well as crowdfunding his new book The Mule, which uh, there is a link to in the show notes, or you can find it on unbound.co.uk. We discussed loads of stuff, including uh, the industry, the state of uh, television, the state of radio, uh, how to get into radio, how to get into TV writing, as well as um, how where to send your scripts if you're really interested in getting that out there. Um, and, and also talked about crowdfunding and uh, the benefits of social media and the different platforms that you can be on. This interview, unfortunately, couldn't take place in person like all my other ones have done. He lives too far away for me to get to that. But what we did was we had a Skype conversation, which means the sound quality isn't as good as it usually is. If this is your first podcast you're listening to, uh, usually a lot better uh, audio-wise. But I've done my best, and I've done a lot of edits on it and tweaked it. I've also uh, re-recorded my voice uh, on some bits so that you can hear what I was saying, because the main... The main thing I focused on when I was recording was his answers, because I can't get him back on, but I can get my time to re-record. So if any luck, this is a very usable thing for most people. Um, I was able to listen to it all the way through and hear it, but then I've listened to it four times, so I should know it by heart by now. As always, if you want to follow the questions that were said during the show, you can find all of them at asktheindustrypodcast.tumblr.com. If you enjoyed the show, please leave it an iTunes review. It's genuinely really helpful. How is it helpful? Well, quite simply, guests are reading those before they get back to me. I've had two guests come back to me in the last week to say that they would love to come on because it seems like it's a really valuable resource for so many people based on the fact that we have five shows out now and 16 reviews it's helpful if you have a minute and you're on itunes please do it also if you have another minute or if you have spare time in that first minute please share the link either the tumblr post so that people can stream it if they're not on itunes or just uh, tell people about it it really helps with the downloads it really helps with me getting more guests on because often guests with agents or management or at a certain level um, in terms of like production companies or television or radio they really care about the download number don't ask me why to be honest with you I'm trying my best not to check it every five minutes but if I can tell them that X number of people have downloaded an episode that is similar to the subject I'm gonna bring them on to they'll they're more interested in coming on so please share it around please give it to people that you think would be interested in it um, Either, either just this episode of the podcast or the podcast as a whole. I'm sure there are people out there who want to get a book published or a radio show produced or a television show commissioned and it, this will actually help them or have an impact on their journey towards that. If you do share it on Twitter, uh, please hashtag it with Ask the Industry Podcast, the or one word, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you a thank you tweet. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at This Made Me Cool. So... Without any more delay, here is David. Um, when I left college, I'd written a short comedy story, which I sent to a magazine called City Limits, who were kind of a left-wing timeout. And they printed it, but they weren't in the habit of printing stories. So they gave me some reviews to do. And around the same time, I was... Yeah, I wrote to the editor of The Enemy and told him that The Enemy wasn't very good. And he offered me some work. Uh, I, I assume that would be something you'd recommend for everyone to do if they wanted to be a journalist? or is or well, that... I, didn't, I didn't know that I was actually asking for work. It was kind of classic passive-aggressive. And I think you find anybody who writes to you and says that I hate you is actually in love with you, and I think that's what I was doing. But I think the editor was smart enough to realise that, because I didn't actually say, oh, give us a job. He yeah. couldn't reject me. Fair but enough. no, these days, I mean, I really... I basically 
times are so hard people will work for free or pay to work so yeah i don't know maybe just be as aggressive as possible might work and just surprise people people yeah. tend to take it too much now fair enough yeah yeah i mean it was was your intention always to be a writer then or no my intention was never to be no that's not true i didn't know i didn't ever know what i wanted to do i wanted to be an archaeologist when i was six i wanted to be an actor when i was 15 I really didn't know what I wanted to do in life. I went to London to do law because I thought being a lawyer might be a bit like being an actor and then realized I would be, I was no good at law. So then I had no idea what I was going to do with my life and I was an adult. So that was a bit scary. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of listeners are going to relate to that. We're all, we're all kind of doing stuff we enjoy, but not sure if it's going to be a career, if that makes sense, uh, which sounds like, it sounds like you enjoyed writing but didn't think of it as a career at that point? Is that fair? Well, yeah. I think if somebody looking from outside would have worked out that I wanted to be a writer because I'd always written for... Whenever there was an outlet, so I'd always written for school magazines. Um, I'd written a bit for a college magazine. I'd tried to write a novel when I was a teenager. I was always writing, um, yeah, to a slightly obsessive extent, but it just... It's like if your hobby is scratching your ear... You don't think you're going to make any money at it. And maybe it was the 70s thing that everyone says about punk. You didn't think you could be in a band because musicians were highly trained and so on. It didn't occur to me that I could make a living from being a writer because I thought writers were like Charles Dickens or John Cleese and I wasn't either of them. You specialise in journalism in terms of your writing area, which is pretty much comedy um, and, and re reviewing stuff. Would you, would you recommend specialising or was that again just a, a fluke? Well, that's slightly tangled up. I had I did two different things. I reviewed music, so that was my journalistic thing. I'm not a real journalist. I am a member of the NUJ, and if you want to be a journalist, you should join. Um, I did reviews, yeah, for music papers and interviews for years and years, because that was my hobby. I loved listening to music. But I was watching television with a friend one night, and... She said, you could do better than this. I forget what the program was. And comedy had been a hobby I didn't think I could make any money out of or live off. So that's how that started, really. But, yeah, I think special, special specialising can be good for people. Some people find if they get their head down and go in a certain direction, they'll become an expert in an area. Some people prefer the hack route of being good at everything. It's horses for courses, really. It's what you think suits you if you're a massive expert on stamp collecting or gossip it might be a way for you to go to enjoy your hobby but if like most people you like a bit of everything you like watching celebrity big brother and you like reading novels and you like cheese then it might be better for you to pursue every route was there like a moment in your journalistic career where you thought i want to write for a living this is like did, there was, was there a moment where it turned from oh i'm just doing this as a hobby to yeah, I can actually do this for a living, or I want to do this for a living. After I'd written to the editor of the NME, and he'd said, send me something, at this point also, I would I think the deal was, I'd got a very bad law degree, and I said to my parents, I don't know why I discussed it with my parents, but I said to my parents, look, I'm, I'm never going to be a good lawyer, I might want to do something else, and they said, well, just go and take the civil service exam, just do that for us. And I thought, okay. And I went and took the civil service exam and I nearly failed it, which was a massive shock because I was good at exams. And I went for an interview and they didn't give me the best job in the world. They just said you could be a clerk or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was like, I just, I think at that moment I thought, well, the alternative is really depressing. So I will take the risk. And because I'd earned enough money from the music journalism, I'd earned just enough money to subsist with a bit of housing benefit. It was, oh, I can do this. And obviously my parents were very worried for many years afterwards until they saw my name on Harry Hill. <laughs> that, that is a, a, from my research, that's quite a gap between... It's a long gap. Yeah, and that makes me feel a little bit better because I'm still in that gap. Long gap, but if you, as long as you don't die, um, it's a good it's fine. So it's worth, the, it's worth the push. Oh, yeah. The first thing that I have written down here for you getting stuff published outside of journalism was submitting jokes to Spitting Image. That's right. And was that 
just emailing jokes in, like, because there's a program called News Jack on the BBC where writers can just email in, or were you commissioned for that? Well, um, I hate saying this, but they didn't have email. Then I watched Spit an Image, and yeah, I sent in unsolicited material, I think it's still called that. Right. I wrote three sketches. One of them was about Ronald Reagan, so it must have been in the mid <clears throat> 80s. And the producer wrote back and he said he liked one of the sketches and they filmed it. And it was one of those, it's a sort of a beginner's luck thing that I never had that kind of luck again. You know, I threw a dart and it was a bullseye straight away. And then I was just throwing darts at the board for about six years and they all missed. And I probably, I got a few jokes on spitting image, but hardly anything. I just didn't know how to write sketches. I just got lucky with the thing I'd written. And it's really weird, you know, sometimes you make a pot and it looks like a pot and then you try again and it just looks like an accident. And that's what my comedy writing was. It was very hit and miss. I had no idea how to write. What, had you ever written a sketch before or was it literally you just wrote down what you thought a sketch was and sent it in? Or It must have been, yeah. I, you know, you watch a program. It's like, it's easy to copy things. You watch, everybody knows the format of a sketch, you know. There's a setup, then some funny stuff and it ends. But it's what you put in it, and sort of you can ramble around. So yeah, I had no idea how to write a sketch, and some the first one I had a really, it was just having a clear idea, I had a really clear idea what the sketch was about, and then it wrote itself. The other things I submitted, I can't even remember what they were. I didn't have a clear idea. Obviously, this was this was a while ago now. Would you say sending in unsolicited material is still an avenue that people should be pursuing or attempting? People should be pursuing every avenue possible um yeah it's harder these days i think to get material on because there's less money people are more reluctant to give people money they're more reluctant to take people on because that means giving out more money to people but at the same time you know comedy is a great big chewing machine it needs writers all the time because writers like you get old and die so there's always a space and you should really do it to block out the people who are no good you know there's a very strong need to make sure that people who are no good at writing comedy don't get into it and are blocked out by people who are good so the short answer is yes use every avenue possible and remember you know they can't beat you up for it if they if you get a letter if you get an email saying we don't accept unsolicited material well boo-hoo you know tough um send someone else the material or send them the material again just keep doing it how would you because you've worked on some shows before like in the production end as well as the writing end how would you receive it if someone emailed you or uh, someone in your staff sent round like unsolicited material would you still read it or would you just be like we're too busy on the show or would it depend on the show or well I, I don't work on shows as part of the team as a rule I'm sort of hired in but in in reality people constantly get on touch yeah, sorry people constantly get in touch with me on Twitter or, or Facebook and ask if they can send me something they've written. And I generally do read it, and if I've got some useful advice for them, I will give it to them. I tend not to talk about who's going to make a show or where they can send it, because I think, to a certain extent, you should learn how to do that yourself. I also think that if you want to email, say, Mary Smith at the BBC, then it's quite easy to work out her email address. It would be mary.smith or Mary Smith. Basically, my golden rule is work out what you want to write, then find out who makes programs that are like what you want to write, then find out who they are and where they are, and keep emailing them or harassing them until they accept your stuff. I feel like we should all credit you when we email people now, and then then, then they'll know who to blame if they're getting annoyed. Absolutely, I don't care. Um, <laughs> to say, David Quantic, who I've never met, told me to email you. Uh, sometimes I'm tempted to give out the emails of specific people who annoy me. There are TV producers who I've known for years who haven't got round to reading my stuff. And it's like, oh, for God's sake, what chance have new people got? More, hopefully. Fingers crossed. I, well, no, I, did, that, I did that a couple of days, well, about two weeks ago now. I, um, I wanted Shane Allen on, you know, the, from the BBC, the Comedy Commissioner. Oh, yeah. And I couldn't find his email address on the website. But I noticed all of the email addresses were first name, dot last name. So I sent him first name dot last name an email and in it I said, I'm sorry if this is intrusive or whatever, but I'd really love to have you on my podcast. I'd love to chat to you. Um, here's all the details. 
would you be interested? And he emailed back. He was lovely. He was like, yeah, no, no one ever emails me about podcasts. I don't think, I don't think <laughs> my email's even listed. Thanks for getting in touch. Yeah. So, exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. So, but no, I, I had a really big, I had a moment after I'd sent the email where I was like, oh God, what if, he, what if I annoy him and then he never wants to talk to me? And then when I've got something to get commissioned or I want something, do you know what I mean? You'd have, you'd have to do that. I don't know, Shane, but you'd have to do that all the time, constantly. And the thing is, people people need people need to be interviewed. They need contributors. They need writers. So in the end, you know, if they want you, they'll put up with the odd email. People, <coughs> people put up with being insulted to their faces in television, you know. So a polite email isn't the end of the world. That's good to know. Um, so you said that you're you're often not working part of a as a team. You're sort of freelanced in, as it were. Yeah. Um, I think of an example. Basically, not so much now, but on a lot of on a lot of shows I've worked on, you'll get a contract to do a certain amount of stuff. But quite often you'll contribute stuff and just hope that they use it. But I never feel like I never feel like part of a team unless it's something like TV Burp, where I literally sat in a room with the other writers and the production team, or something like Veep, where again you literally sit in a room with people. But even something like Veep. I do most of my writing from home, on my own, on a computer. Do you prefer that? Yeah, I love it. I think it's it's great to collaborate with people, but kind of at the planning stage. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of like, this is a terrible example, building a house. When you sit, you're the builder and you sit around with a decorator and an interior designer and the plumber and the electrician. You're right, we're going to build a house. Well, how many bedrooms? Five. Is it going to be a garden? Yes. Will there be a shower or a bath? Both. And then you all go off and do your bits and come back. I much prefer that to everybody I did a conference call the other day with five people and about halfway through the summer said, actually, David, we don't really need you at this stage. And while they just discussed stuff and they, and it was just, yeah, a lot of time being a writer is being outside the team because what you do only affects people at a certain point. People don't have to know stuff until you've written it very often. Sometimes that's not true if they know about costumes and things, but you're not, you know, you're not filming anything, you're not dressing anybody or acting. It's hard to explain, but I don't know, I've never felt like part of a team. Would and you... people, I've, people I've worked with would say that they didn't feel I was either. <clears throat> Is, I mean, the, for me, I've never written anything for TV or radio. Uh, I've done some journalism work and um, I've, I do a lot of stand-up, like live stuff. Oh, yeah. And I find... For writing stand-up, it's often useful to start on my own and then do some of it in with, with, in collaboration with a friend or, or bounce it off of someone. But then ultimately on stage is where I kind of write the finishing, like just that bit, like that sort of topper bit. Um, and it sounds like for TV, after a while, or maybe immediately in your case, you're able to sit down and just sort of process where the character wants to go or in in the case of tv uh, tv burp you kind of know the character a bit so you're writing for a uh predefined sort of structure of a character and you're sort of trying to put your so it's your funny thought through the how he'll how harry hill will like deliver it as it were because because to me it's interesting that you can sit down and just pump out a load of jokes for a different person for t for, for a whole different medium if that makes sense because obviously there'll be stuff in the read through, there'll be stuff in the production. Is that is that just something that comes to you naturally, or is that something that y y like took you time to develop, or have I overthought it? It depends. Um, something like TV Burp is an inter is a good example because Harry comes to the show with a character already in place, and I didn't know a lot of Harry's work, but I knew it well enough. And basically, with Harry, it was great because he didn't want to do a load of his old characters and catchphrases. He, but he did want to be Harry Hill, the floppy-haired, baldy comedian. So that was really easy to write because he's there in the room. You know, he knows what he wants and what he doesn't want, and it's quite easy to work out who it is. But when it's a new show, I remember when I worked on On the Hour, the radio show, which introduced Alan Partridge. That was very interesting because, of course, some people like Steve Coogan and Armando Iannucci had a very clear idea of what Alan Partridge was going to be. But for me and my writing partner, Stephen Wells, we had no idea what Alan Partridge was going to be like until we heard him. And even then we didn't quite know. 
And even then it wasn't the Alan Partridge. That, so you adapt, you learn with everybody else, unless you're really brilliant and you know exactly what you want straight off. Do you prefer, or maybe, you're, maybe I'll ask you your preference and what your experience is in terms of other people in writing. So do you prefer to be in on the ground level like that with On The Hour where it's the start of a show? Or do you prefer to come in when the show's established so you might have seen a couple of episodes so it's kind of easier to you, for you to understand the characters that you're writing for? I don't mind, really. I didn't do the first series of Veep, the HBO thing that I write on. Um, that was useful to watch. But also you want to make your own contribution. You're brought in because of what you can do. So it swings and roundabouts. It's very exciting to be on the first series or something, to be there right at the start. And, yeah, I think I prefer that because coming in later on a show, you're never quite part of it. I am part of the Veep team, but if I'd been there on the first series, it would have been even more exciting. You said that so when you were writing for On The Hour, um, what I read of this is that you were invited onto the team uh, as, through, through a friend, is that true? No. Okay. My writing partner and me, Stephen Wells, got a letter from Armando Iannucci asking us to contribute to the show. He'd read a column that we wrote in The Enemy, which was kind of a comedy mocking column of popular culture. And he really liked it. And I think he thought that on the air at that point would have more of a music um, content. It didn't very much, but we, yeah. So that's how we we literally got a letter from Armando. I still have it in a box. We got a letter from Armando asking us to write for it. And was it a case of you just sent in jokes via like back to a postal address that was on that letter, or was it you came that you had like a writing job that you went in like nine five kind of thing from there? Or we went in. Armando's always worked a bit like this. We went in for meetings where he'd explain what he wanted and what he didn't want, and then we'd go away. And write stuff up, and I think we had a lot of meetings on that, that one. Nowadays, it is more you get an email from him about what you want to do. How do you, as a creative person, how do you find writing for like a spec of? Because I find limitations are quite useful. If I put my own limitations in on the joke that I don't want to cover this area of a certain, so say I'm covering relationships, I'm not going to cover this area of relationships. I'm going to try and focus on this area to try and you know find the funniest point i can on a niche thing do you find when someone brings you in and says i want this i don't want this that makes writing easier or harder for you yeah uh, you're exactly right and this is a big a massively big interest of mine in, in my writing book how to write everything i touch on it there's well, i've forgotten the quote but basically someone was talking about writing poetry and one argument somebody might say oh it's really hard to write a poem because you know every line has to rhyme Somebody said, well, actually, that's a really good way of focusing you, because if you have to get this thought in, but you have to find words that rhyme, you go in a certain direction. And I love limitations. You know, the famous thing, a lot of, well, I think science fiction films that have been made really cheaply are actually more imaginative and more interesting than expensive ones, because when you can't just go out and spend a million quid on a funny-shaped gun, you know, you might come up with a better idea. There's a there's a bit, there's a Jim Jarmusch film whose name escapes me, which is helpful. There's a prison break in it, and it's hilarious because instead of having 20 minutes of planning the prison break, seeing them tunnelling out and bribing the guards, they just say, we've got to break out of here, and the next shot is three of them running out of a prison while people shoot at them. And that's great, because they obviously couldn't afford to shoot it or didn't have time, but it's a lot funnier and a lot more interesting and avoids the cliché. So, yeah, limitations are great. You should always do things with the wrong hand. No, I, I agree. I've been learning that in the last sort of 18 months or so. My, my, la my last year, my Edinburgh show, um, I, I, for a number of reasons, uh, decided to make the bucket for prostate cancer rather than myself. I did the free fringe. And as a result, every decision I made after I said I was going to do that was, can I afford to do it? Because if you're not getting, if you know you're not getting a penny out of the show, mm. you've, you've limited yourself completely. And so as a result, everything was stripped down as much as possible and it really made me kind of work to make the show funny with no money, as it were. And so there were no gimmicks, there was no, you know, it just it was just a lot of fun to do. Yeah, I completely agree on that. And I'm quite I think, I think it's great. There's another interesting area that when you see with writers, a lot of times, and musicians, people do things as themselves. They feel very restricted. But sometimes, and this can be a bit wanky, if you do something as a character, 
if you write in a character or if you perform, a lot of stand-ups do this as a character or sing as a character, suddenly you get this whole new freedom. You know, I think you you must be aware of this. It's when somebody like Al Murray goes on stage, he can say things he wouldn't say as himself, but he can say them as the pub landlord. And I think that's opened up his imagination as well. So again, that's a limitation. You say, I'm not going to be me. Yeah, a, f- a few friends on the circuit and a few acquaintances I know have dabbled around with playing a character or have you know stuck on a wig and and you know put on some you know false moustache and stuff just to try and not feel like themselves which i know is odd because a lot of people are trying their best to try and be the most comfortable they are as themselves on stage but it's just another way i think of trying to open your mind up yeah i think these are all valid systems and there's also the great moment of this massive argument about authenticity and i'm not very much a big fan of authenticity i prefer david bowie clearly pretending to be an alien when he's not to some, I don't know, Ed Sheeran pretending to be Ed Sheeran. And I think that works a lot because the problem with the circuit is, of course, that there's millions of comedians who have almost exactly the same experience of life. Hmm. And so their experience-based comedy, you know, the great cliche about stand-up comedians is they all do jokes about ordering a takeaway pizza and you can't get any Rizzlers at the late-night garage when you've got the munchies, which is a massive cliche, but you do see comedians who do that, you know. Whereas if you decide that your persona is that of an angry egg, then ironically, the possibilities are endless. The, cl- the cliches are sometimes there for a reason. Oh, the cliches are there because they're real. All cliches are based on reality. But it's, you know, if I went to a gig, I wouldn't want to see 98 identical Bruce Springsteen bands. And if I went to a comedy gig, I wouldn't want to see six 28-year-old men doing jokes about their flatmates and how the sofa smells of farts. <laughs> You're not the only one. Uh, uh-huh. No, it's um, I uh, yeah, I had an I had an argument with someone a couple for about five months ago because Justin Justin Bieber had just been pulled over for speeding under the influence uh, a week after he'd been recorded peeing in a bucket in a restaurant, <laughs> and like two days after, like it was just a load of stuff he'd done. He'd done like a lot of and, he, and then he, and then he'd like been in you know like the the mug shot of jail and stuff, and I went down to a I went down to open my to try some new material. And three comics did jokes about him looking like a lesbian. And I was like, he's just been pulled over for being under the influence. Like, there's a whole area there (laughs) that's way more interesting and no one's covering it. And you want to talk about his look. It's pathetic. And of course, when you've got that great, that great sway of the possible material, it's what you do with it. You know, and that's what makes people different. Eddie Izzard's take would be completely different on Simon Amstel's take or Joe Brand's take or whoever. And that's the important thing. That's the other thing is everybody doing the same, everybody using the same source material is fine, but it's what you do with it. It's always one of the hazards of Edinburgh, I seem to remember, that, you know, there's always the joke. I think I went once when it was the year of the first Big Brother and everyone was doing jokes about Big Brother and people would just get so bored going out. Mm. Oh, what did you say? I saw a comedian who did the same material, the same subjects. So it's very hard. And that's another thing. Ed, you know, someone like Eddie Izzard, who's a comedian I really like, it's very hard to mimic him because he does just delve into his mind in a different way. And Ross Noble does it in a does the surreal area, but also differently. I mean, I I think I think there is enough people doing it from my experience of the circuit. But the problem is there are too many people p- trying comedy and therefore not pushing themselves because they think, oh, it's just a hobby, or they think, oh, I'm just gi- giving this a go, and as a result, it waters down at at certain levels the quality acts who are trying stuff yeah i think if you've not got much competition as well if are you if you're just playing against mulch then you're not going to get much better whereas if you're going out every night and you're playing gigs and the other comedians are good or interesting because that's the thing there's so many comedy clubs now i believe that <laughs> it's not really my expert area but yeah competition in that respect is very good because it gets rid of people who are no good you want them to piss off really <laughs> well, I mean, okay, let's let's stick to your 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 strong suit, which is um, TV, radio, journalism, and internet uh, writing and and crowdfunding. Radio used to be kind of an incubator for for big talent. It used to be sort of the place where you would put um, up and coming people from maybe the circuit or from you know write different writing disciplines um, <laughs> and and get their message out there or get their thing out to a wider audience things like douglas allens or chris morris or uh, the mighty boosh more recently 
it sort of seems a bit like it's been sidelined recently um, with a web offering or you know tv being the route that most people want to go down do you think this is gonna like long-term cool because the thing is you have to with radio the thing i like about radio is the same thing i like about podcasting is you have to use your imagination to picture the scene mm. or, or to you know Im- to bring it to life do you think we're going to lose an audience who use their imagination no because i think radio is a lot bigger than people think um big radio comedy shows might not be original but they have a lot of listeners it's still a way in i mean i've got a bit of a bugbear about panel shows especially panel shows which seem to have the same people in people who are very talented in my opinion but it's a very small world radio it's yeah there should be more comedy chris morris sort of came along at a kind of a golden age when people were doing more comedy when glr existed and chris did comedy on that and when radio one did comedy which was a fantastic idea because it meant that you got you were able to do stuff that radio four wouldn't touch and Radio 3 or 2 wouldn't touch. The problem is that everything is quite stylized, so all the four networks have their own audiences. Radio 4 is very much a kind of middle-class, cosy slot, which means that certain comedians wouldn't really get a look in. It's just the way it is. You can't imagine Frankie Boyle on Radio 4, for example. Be hard-pressed to imagine Stuart Lee on Radio 4, because he's slightly harsh. Um... And the way the slots are orientated, so you get like the cosy morning show, you get the slightly weird but not that weird 11 o'clock comedy show, which is only 15 minutes long, which is really annoying, a lot of them. Or you get the 6.30 show, which has to be massively populist. And that's obviously a lot more limited. So I think, yeah, it is annoying that you have to be visual. But the thing about the web is that you don't have to be that visual. You can just put up a title card or a cheap image or a cartoon. So, yeah, again, I'm in favour of the web just because cheap means imaginative. Yeah, completely agree, as we were talking about before. I mean, wh- while we're slightly on the subject, you, in 2000, made an on- or what was called the first ever online sitcom called The Junkies. That's right. Um, and, I mean, I'm, I'm currently writing a sitcom, and I, I specifically am writing it for the internet, which means that a lot of my writing is directed at the audience as I feel they'll be watching it so like they'll be nearer the screen than they would be with a TV they'll be maybe having a tab open doing something else at the same time that you know all that kind of stuff mm. and I would love to know what you your experience was with distributing shows yourself and using the internet in it wasn't I wouldn't say it's primitive form but it wasn't as established as it is now so was there like an end goal you had for it or was it just getting it out there it was getting it out. It was very primitive. The, broad, the problem was that broadband didn't come in until six months later. It was literally like that. We, we'd we made it and we wanted people to see it. And it was like, we can put it on a website, put up the pilot on online. And it was all quite new to us. And what happened was that we had a million hits straight away. And my writing partner, Jane Busman, reckons we had that because no one could watch the bloody thing. So they kept coming back to it. So that, that was, I mean, that was the great advantage because it was not particularly good quality, not the, the show, the actual upload, which is still out there, is quite fuzzy. Basically, people took ages to watch it, and it became a bit more, it became a bit mysterious and interesting. And I think we made it in very much a traditional format. So I think if we were making it now, we would make it shorter, snappier, you know, with more claims on people's attention. It was quite languid compared to what you might see nowadays. But I am told that Ricky Gervais asked for a copy. In fact, loads of people ask for copies. It's probably the most influential program ever made. Is is it commercially available? It is not. Well, it's, there's a dodgy version on YouTube um, taken from a VHS. We always wanted to make it commercially available, but the problem was that we made it for free on the understanding that if it ever got picked up, all the cast and crew would be paid. And everyone who's tried to put it out has been unaware of this fact and assumes that they can just have it for free, and they can't. It would cost a few grand. It would be nice to put it out at some point. It would be nice to actually find the tapes, the disc. I think they might be in Jane's mum's attic, but we don't really know. Did what you thought of things like Go Faster Stripe, um, and if you would ever consider putting your, for example, sitcom on something like that? Yeah, I mean, so long as it was all, I'm sure they're completely shit, so long as everybody involved got paid and there were no problems with rights issues, that would be great. 
I'm, I'm always open to any form of distribution and communication as long as people get their money. So, are we, well, the, the internet is notorious for artists putting stuff up for free and it's become yeah. sort of a, a default price point, should we say, mm. online specifically. I mean, I mean th- there are ways of making money off of stuff for free and it's not just adverts. Do you think it's become too clouded now? Do you think more people should be sharing what they create using the internet or do you think there should be a, a sort of limit on like you know you should just put up your best stuff not just your you know work in progressy bits or do you think gi- i mean given that you just you just said that some of your stuff from like a you know a few years earlier got picked up by uh, you know other writers and they invited you to work on their projects because they found you through that do you think it's a really good thing that there's an archive of stuff that people have worked on there i think you should <coughs> Well, you should always put up your best stuff. Work in progress is something that gets on my nerves. Um, reading something about this, I know when I buy music, if I get you know a box set of the Beatles, and actually not the Beatles, if I get a box set of I don't know, say Nirvana, who I don't like that much, I would enjoy a couple of CDs, but I'm not really interested in Kurt Cobain picking his nose or in back in a bit of chat. And certainly with comedy, the problem with a lot of comedy is because it involves things like improvisation, because it involves a lot of a few random methods and hit and miss stuff, is that quite often the outtakes are appalling. I've seen major comedians do improvisation to get sketch ideas and you just want to die and you really just want to say, can I come back in when you've got the funny idea? Because (laughs) watching people do funny characters for an hour or three hours, it's great for them. I always go with the thing the public are often the best judge. You read about so many artists or comedians going, oh, I thought that was a brilliant show or a brilliant song, and everyone else going, no, it was awful. There's a reason it didn't sell. So I'm in favour of editing. I think you should have the option. If I had a website, I would put up pay links to stuff. I would have free links to stuff, both of these stuffs being good. But I would have a section called basically, this is all crap, but if you want to watch it, you can. I like that. Sorry, I was just, I was just thinking um, of something similar. Um, I that's interesting because for me I'm a big fan of the free market system. I, I think it I think it works best, especially online, because you've you've opened up your market. So you've opened up your market to, to seven billion people potentially, mm. which means that statistically, if you can't find one person in seven billion who like what you've done, yeah, you should stop doing that. Do you know what I mean? And I think so. I the one of the great things about the internet is you can put stuff up and nobody will watch it. And that's fine. That way, everyone's happy. There used to be a thing called vanity publishing when you would, it's a bit similar to Unbound and Pledging, where basically you would pay somebody to print a slim volume of your poetry and thoughts. Um, And that would be it. It would stay in a box and you could give it to your friends who may or may not want it. And there was a certain advantage to that. What I do object to is going on, is just going on Facebook and being told I have to watch someone's video. Yep, yep. That's, that's, 80% 80% of my timeline where people ask me to like their page or uh, watch their video and uh. I think the fundamental missed point with that is a social media account is what is technically known as a permission marketing method where I have opted in to get your updates by liking or following you or doing all that kind of stuff whereas other people see it as a vanity metric where I've got 4,000 likes on here yeah, but how many of those people really care about what you're doing and how many of them are your friends that you've forced to... Um... Oh, yeah. When I started selling this book, the Unbound book, I um, was very conscious that every time I put up a link to it, every time I emailed a friend about it, I was essentially deleting an aspect of my friendships <laughs> with people because it is intrusive. And, yeah, some people do assume I have some friends who assume that everything they do is riveting because it's interesting to them, so it'll be interesting to me. And it's not very often, it's not. And quite often, if it is riveting and interesting, it is commercially available. So, yeah, I know I know lots of people who are very funny or good at writing songs, but generally I will go and buy that stuff along okay. with everybody else. Well, you, while we're on the subject, because um, do, do you want to explain what Unbound is to people listening who maybe haven't heard of the service before? I will give it a go. Unbound is a book publisher. They resemble pledging services in the sense that they invite you to ask all your friends and your acquaintances on social networks to contribute money so that you can write the book or get the book together, in return for which they will 
do a lot more than a lot of pledging people. They will print the book, design it, get you an editor, um, and have connections with real distribution and publicity networks, like a real publisher. And finally, in return for which, you split the money 50-50, which is my favorite bit, because people go, oh, they get half the money. It's like, yeah, a real publisher gets 80% of the money, or 90%. So, you know, it's not a bad deal at all. A lot of people listening probably know that you have other books out through major publishing houses. What would be the reason for you taking this one to a crowdsourcing means? Um, simply because the other books that I wrote, people came to me. They said, we're doing a series of rock books about this. We're doing a book about Eddie Izzard. Would you like to write it? We're doing a grumpy old men sort of cash-in book. Pretty much everything else is somebody coming to me saying, would you like to write this book? Whereas in this case, nobody, I'm not known as a fiction writer, you know, so nobody came to me and said, nobody ever comes to somebody and says, would you like to write a novel, unless they're a top model. I suppose this is going to be an odd question for you to answer, because your experience with the major publishing houses is with their idea. So I suppose in a, in a way, are you, I mean, you're not a ghostwriter, but you're kind of the name that they attach to it, or is it because you are the expert in that certain field like you've written a lot of biographies of musicians and comedians and obviously you've written a lot of stuff about musicians and comedians so was it they just approached you because your affiliation with that or was it because you have like right i'm just sort of trying to work out what their reasoning was to go with you over anyone else yeah no i get it if it's a music book I was a music journalist for 20 years, so they approached lots of music journalists and asked them. Um, the comedy books would be because somebody fell through or because, yeah, they approach different people. I have an agent, and what generally happens when you have an agent is that the most famous client that they have is approached to do a project. The most famous client turns it down. They then approach the second most famous client who turns it down. They then say to my agent, well, for God's sake, have you got anybody who will do this book? And my agent suggests me. That's really honest of you. Uh, I mean, I know you probably know the process better than most because you've done it. I mean, I don't know how many books you've written in total, but there's a lot on Amazon. And some of them aren't real. Um, some of them are somebody made a Wikipedia page of stuff that I didn't actually write, but they've been listed on some kind of catalogue of forthcoming books. And you haven't got any other books forthcoming other than the Unbound one? Um... I'm going to write, I haven't, no, I'm going to write, oh, hang on. Yes, I wrote this book, How to Write Everything, and it's doing all right, so I'm going to write a sequel called How to Be a Writer, which is about the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of being a writer rather than, you know, writing, if you see what I mean. Yeah. It's about what it's like to get up in the morning and have to pay the bills and get books published and write books with dogs in the house and things like that. I'd read that. That sounds, because for me... Uh, if I don't have writing work and I don't have that many gigs booked because I haven't booked gigs so I was expecting to get writing work you you do get up in the morning and go need to do something uh, yeah. and, and it'd be interesting to hear from someone who's done it for a number of years how you I mean how, obviously you've got an agent so I assume they sort out most of your writing stuff would that be fair to say? Um, it's a mixture it really depends my agent's got me some important work I've got me this important work. Um, the thing that I always say, a friend of mine said, agents aren't managers. Agents don't come to you with a cigar and go, boy, have I got you a great gig next week? You're playing with whatever, you know, you've got this book. Agents really, what they are for is that you say, I've got, I've been offered this piece of work. Can you look at the contract? And then they tell you if it's a good job or not. Agents look after your money and your career. Um, it's a stage that I'm at because I know lots of people, people do approach me more directly. Um, but yeah, agents are good. You don't, you don't, you literally don't need an agent, but they're really good to have. You know, it's like you literally don't need an iPad, but they're pretty good. <laughs> That's prob probably the easiest to understand metaphor I've ever heard for an agent, <laughs> because that's spot on. Like the amount of, I, I mean, I assume you, uh, well. I'll assume you haven't Googled me. I've been doing this about four years and I, I've had a few conversations with uh, agents and I know friends of mine who are just thinking about signing up with agents and their big reservation is I'm getting gigs at the moment and I'm getting little bits of work here and there at the moment. 
I don't want to give up any of the percentage of the money of that to them. However, I do want the option that they might get me more work. But then you sit down and think, well, say a writing day is 150, 200 pounds a day and they get 10% of that. How much work are you going to get from them for 15, 20 quid a day? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to take the leap because there are other things as well. Some people won't look at work without an agent. An agent does look good. You know, it's like this, this sort of, in another way, another bad metaphor, it's equivalent to buying a Rolex when you can't really afford it to impress people. See, if, you have, if you haven't got an agent, it can go against you. It's like, you know, have you got an, I haven't got an agent. People are like, oh, really? Maybe you're no good. So it's generally worth the money. The problem is you might get a bad agent, but you can always leave. So I would say if you have the opportunity to get an agent, get an agent. I, I've had a very first-hand experience of that because I for example I went to London Book Fair last year and a lot of the publishing houses that I went up to to talk to because I was like you can do that they're, they're all there to talk to different industry people mm. and the minute they find out you're an author without a, a an agent they won't talk to you regardless of the fact that I have been published by a publishing house before I have writing credits I have and it feels yeah. really weird that they're still running on that system because there are friends of mine who have got a base of people on you know, YouTube or Vine or Twitter or whatever who w have gone away from that and self-published and made a lot of money and then they come running after you. And obviously by that point, you either make a stand and go, no, I you know, I offered it to you and you said no. Or you, you sort of snap and go, well, I could use more money. That'd be good. And it's, it's just interesting to me. I mean, how much stock do you put in social media and social media sites how do you mean in terms of so for example you said that you've been putting out links for your book um you know is there, has there been a pattern of more sales have come through from certain platforms or um have you found that it's been not useful helpful i think it's been slightly helpful i do i am convinced i've never asked that i have got because i I use well i don't use twitter professionally for this but i like <clears throat> i like putting jokes on twitter because I don't know about you, but you get, well, it's probably different for you, because if I get a one-liner, I often can't use it. Because, you know, I can't exactly go to Veep and go, I've got a really funny joke about Nigel Farage. But on Twitter, if I've got a funny strand of ideas, I just put it up straight away, and I'm sure that has helped with people to get work from time to time. As for the, yeah, as for the Unbound thing, that helps. with rate. When I've got radio, I shamelessly promote and I think everybody does through Facebook and Twitter. And I think it's an acceptable thing to do. And if you've got that platform, I mean, I've got lots, and I've got allegedly 40,000 followers, which means that people are enjoying it because otherwise they, you know, they would drop me. Mm. So it's a kind of, it's a circular thing. The more you promote yourself, the more people think you're famous the more, and so on. Like I was on a show called, I was on Celebrity Come Dine With Me once and I wasn't a celebrity, but because I was on it, some people thought I was a celebrity. It's kind of the fake it till you make it type thing. That's what Absolutely. It's the David Bowie model. You've got no money, so hire a limousine, go to all the trendy nightclubs, and be seen talking to models, and everyone thinks you're famous. Yeah, I was told about that story recently, and uh, uh, I didn't know that was what he did. Yeah, I didn't know for you. He wasn't... It's got kind of the timelines backwards. He's acting like a rock star before he is one. A lot of people have tried it since, and it can really backfire, particularly in a climate where people think being authentic matters. But he got away with it because he just looked so great. And everyone said, yeah, you should be a rock star. Look at you. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, my, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. I, uh, I tend to, I sometimes when I'm self-marketing, I do a bit of self-deprecating, you know, doing a gig here, but don't let that put you off. There's some funny, but you know, that kind of thing. And uh, a few, a few friends of mine have noticed that and said, you should pick yourself up more. You should be like, oh, it's going to be amazing. You know, come on down. I'm going to be there kind of thing. But then I'm I'm kind of, that's not it can be me, but it's not me as well, and it's it's an awkward one I think for for certain performers who are who are trying to self promote. I mean, there's there's val validity in sharing what you've done, mm -hmm. so that your audience knows and you're and you're constantly out there. But is there um do you think there's like a level to to which that you like because the, there's a lot there's a lot of oversharing going on on social media. Do you think there's like a, a line where you should sort of not bombard audiences or do you do you not really mind because you don't really use it there's ways of doing it there's the fake self-deprecating which is basically you just say you know I've, I've got a gig it might be good but you tell forty thousand people yeah 
you know, you or you just relentlessly mention it, say, I'm really sorry to mention this again. You know, I was doing that with, with Unbound. They were basically saying, you have to email all your friends. It's like, oh, I don't want to. So I did. And then they were like, you have to do it again. So of course, I'm saying I'm really sorry, but I'm not in the least sorry, you know. Yeah. I want their money. But you just, or you just go the shameless way. You say, give me some money so I can have a book out. <laughs> but yeah, you just, you also do something that suits your persona. Russell Brand can say, you know, oh, you should go and see my show because you'll make me want, you'll feel like having sex with me. But that's not going to work for Simon Monnery, you know. So it's just, it's horses for courses. You just do something that fits your comic persona. Otherwise people, you know, some people can say, yeah, I'm the greatest in the world. And some people are like, I'm actually a bit shit. But people suss you out pretty quickly. Just tell people your show's good, I guess. Okay. Um, so in terms of the major publishing houses, where you said that you did not get as good a deals as you're getting with Unbound. Um, I wouldn't quite put it that way. I say it's different deals. When I say I, I like the 50-50 split, there's swings and roundabouts with that. But major publishing houses have different overheads and different strategies, and they've got more reach than Unbound. But, I mean, you've also self-published the book called Sparks. Yes. Was um, Is there a reason why that one either has stayed self-published and you've not tried to put it through Unbound or is is it just uh, you've got it out there now so you don't really you're sort of leaving it because you're working on other things or yeah basically I wrote it a long, long time I wrote it probably 10 years before it came out and so it wasn't possible to e-publish when I wrote it and then my wife sent me some links and people have done what and I just thought this is good and I've got it out there and it's not made a great deal of money but it's made some money and it got some nice write-ups from various people and I thought about writing a sequel and had a go at it and just, it's like the moment's passed. Hmm. It's sort of, it's, it's of its time. It's not, I'm not that person. So I wanted to, one thing which is always my good advice to people is you get a lot of people get a project, you know, they work, they've got an idea for a show or a film or a book and they spend their lives doing it, even though it's been turned down because they've got faith. And sometimes you think you just drop it, move on to the next thing, have another idea and then maybe come back to that. And that's what I did with Sparks. I really liked it, but I printed it. It's out there if you want to read it. And I want to write other stuff because I want to write, not just get things published. Were there any self-publishing mistakes that you made that you would do differently if you were to self-publish again? Um, no, I think I did it according to the book. There are You can get stuff from Kindle about how to do it. Um, no, I'm quite happy with it. Okay. Um, and what... When it came to crowdfunding, because you're currently crowdfunding the your your book, the, it's the Mule, isn't it? Yes. Um, how uh, are there any advice that you would give someone who is maybe looking into crowdfunding and is unsure of how? Because often when you when you sit down and look at like a target, so for example, um, say say your target's ten thousand pounds, you've got to get for for the first run of the book or whatever it is that's quite um, an intimidating number when you look at it as it is. Mm. Is there, or are there any tips or bits of advice you would give people who are maybe unsure of being able to find X number of people that would buy the book? I don't know is the answer because it's just, it's so personal to my experience that the friends I've got, the fact that I'm at this age, and bluntly, I've got some friends who are, who've got some money that they can give me. You know, if I was 25, I wouldn't expect 30 of my friends to give me £100. And that's the situation. Um, so I would say just think very realistically. I mean, you're not going to lose any money. Just think very realistically about what you're going to do. And my only real advice would be make sure it's the project that you think might go. Don't do it. You're talking about stand-ups doing stuff for fun. Don't do it just on a whim, you know. I've got quite a good idea for a book. It'll be a right laugh. Maybe you should pay for that one yourself when you're rich. If you've got a project, I, I did. I took the mule to Unbound because I thought it was worth publishing, because I thought it was good enough, and I wouldn't, you know, die of embarrassment. It, my friends, some of whom are real writers, reading it. So it is something you, I would say just something you feel strongly about because you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. You're going to be slightly humiliating yourself asking for money. And one day it's going to come out and people are going to have to read it and you're going to have to deal with that. All good advice. It sounds really cool. What, what um, I imagine you've read and you've obviously written a, a book on writing. Are there any books on writing, comedy, maybe sketch, radio, 
uh, TV shows that you could recommend for people who are who are looking to get into that? Um, no, I've never read a book about comedy. I can't think of any. Are there? I don't know. I've never read a book. I mean, what I do is just read books about other kinds of writing. It all applies. Stephen King's book on writing is really good. Um, William Goldman's books about writing for Hollywood adventures in the screen trade are really good. Um, my book's really good. It's probably genuinely, it's probably the best one about write, comedy writing because it's the only one I can think of. I'm sure there are others, but I haven't read them. You've written a lot of stuff for TV and radio. What would you say is the main difference between writing for when, when you're actually constructing the show? What's the main difference between the two mediums? Speed. Um, apart from the thing that everyone says that radio is cheaper, radio often has a fast to turn around radio four does tend to commission far in the future but i mean i can you know i can write a series of my radio two thing the blaggers guide in the time it takes veep to have a meeting and that's not on a not on a, on a criticism of veep television's harder to make you know what we're doing now could be put out on the radio tomorrow two people talking into some computers tv show requires far more people far more effort input and money so speed and money is the main thing um which is annoying because you think topical radio could be a lot faster but this is the thing you could do a topical sitcom i had an idea for a sitcom about the general election the run-up to the one in may and i could go into radio four and we could have it on the air in a week in television it would be a, a longer gap that's interesting that's, that's very interesting for me because I presumed the gap was not that far apart. It needn't be that far apart. I've done things with a fast turnaround. But, as I say, you know, we could make an entire radio show in a room now. We could make a series. TV show is always going to be slower. And that's why most topical comedy on television is done in panel shows. Because it's, what is it? Panel show is radio on telly, isn't it? A lot of shows, yeah, they're like panel shows out there and stuff. Um, and what do you think? Because there's been a lot of arguments around TV being a dead for stand-up um, unless you're basically a very bland, very sellable and very mainstream comedian who deals with very top-line things in terms of topical material. What, what are your opinions on that? I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, you can broaden it out and say television's always been about people, things being a bit more bland and a bit more popular. There are fewer options i mean i would say well maybe who are the who are the edgy stand-ups that we're talking about simon munray had a brilliant series that got buried Stuart lee and i admire his work greatly Stuart is kind of the bbc's i'm not going to say token you know more unusual comedian but it's it's the thing they'll go oh, we've got Stuart lee we don't need anybody else and that's always going to be the situation there just aren't enough channels bbc3 is very kind of laddish channel four just does panel games and everyone else just does panel games yeah so i would say who are the edgy comedians and why aren't they pushing for shows well i mean uh, there's there's an argument on at least on the levels of circuit that i'm on where certain people will go well i don't even want to go for it because the amount of people who um are good who went for it who didn't get picked up and then the shows they put in that place mm. make it seem like commissioners are trying to play it as safe as possible because of the amount of options out there people have and the amount of um, limited time people have to watch shows. Oh, yeah, people, well, yeah. Um, so maybe try Comedy Central. Maybe just try different options. Um, you've got people like Limmy, who's, I mean, yeah, he's reasonably edgy, but he basically makes a living doing it himself, you know, doing a massive great kind of net thing. I think the other thing with stand-ups, to be honest, is a lot of them are bone idle because it's quite an easy life. Get up late, do a gig, have a drink, take some drugs, go home. So the whole effort process of putting together a show, which is something that writers, say, are more used to, is a bit difficult, is a bit different for a stand-up. Someone like Stuart Lee, I'll keep mentioning because I'm quite ignorant and stuff, but Stuart's thing, you know, he's always been a writer as much as a performer. He's always been very, the format of that show is interesting. It's very formatted. You know, Stuart's obviously spent a lot of time thinking about the structure. I think a lot of stand-ups really just want to be filmed standing on a stage doing their act. I mean, you were saying earlier there's a reason it's a cliche that comedians just do jokes about takeaway pizza and buying Rizzlers at all-night garages. 
Who are your favourite comedians? Sorry? Who are your favourite comedians, like live performers? Oh, I'm really out of touch. I don't really have any. I just sort of lost... I don't, I've got nothing against stand-up. I like stand-up a lot. I think it's a massive skill. I tried it and failed. But my thing as a writer, to be honest, is quite often I'll go to a gig and I'm just trying to work out what the punchline's going to be, which is why I like Eddie Izzard, because he was unguessable. I like Eddie, I like Ross Noble. I like, you know, I like some of the older people, because I'm old, like Al Murray. I just like, for, I like the fact that he puts in so much surrealism in what is ostensibly on the surface, you know, a pub character. Stuart Lee does stuff that nobody else does. Um, I'm not really good on stand-up, to be honest. So, I mean, given your experiments with distributing sitcoms online, mm. you're, I mean, would you say that you would have liked to do more books through online distribution? Um, I don't know. Again, it's an old-fashioned thing. I like, I like real books. So just on a selfish level, I want to see a book on a shelf with my name on it and to go into a shop and see one. I read books on Kindles. As you know, you know I've published an e-book. Um, but I just worry that one day there's going to be a nuclear war and there won't be any computers, so we'll just have nothing but big piles of paper books to read. Sounds quite nice, to be honest. Oh, it's, there's a, yeah. I'll be up for that, just sitting in a library with lots of food and brandy and books. Well, what, what I personally do is I, I, buy, I buy the digital copy because it's cheaper first, and if I like it and I like the artwork on the front cover, I will buy it as a paperback generally and put it on my bookshelf because I like... When I'm writing, I like being able to look over and, and take in the writers that I've enjoyed. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm the generation who had record collections. And for me, it's the same thing, a shelf of albums, a shelf of books. There's a quote, books do furnish a room. I like that. Um, no, I, don't no. like having, I don't like having everything I own in a cloud. I, th this is the thing. I, I'm torn on it because I'm a very much a minimalist. I like having the fewest possessions I can possibly have, so I really mm. appreciate all of them. But however, I do have a lot of books. But I don't think that's a bad thing if I only have the books I really like. I had a weird moment when I basically kept moving a lot, and I just suddenly realised that books being just bits of paper are really replaceable. So I got rid of a load. And now I'm buying a lot of books back in, I go on second-hand bookshop sites and I buy, not f well, first edition sounds poncy, but I buy nicer versions of what I had. So I get original 70s hardbacks of books I bought in paperback. And my shelves look nice. I imagine. Um, out of interest, um, what are those second-hand books? Because I've been, tr I, I go to charity shops to try and find, you know, like a, a book oh, that I want. What are the second-hand bookshops that you go to online? I, I go to I use Abe books, ABE. They're just they're apparently overpriced, but they're amazing because sometimes when I've had money, I will get a proper first edition that costs two hundred quid, and it's just bang there it is. And you know they're great. You get a book in really good condition at a slightly excessive price, but you knew you were going to pay that anyway, so it's a special occasion. But you can get a lot of. I mean, I like Kingsley Amis. He's a horrible man, but he was a very funny writer. And you can get his first editions really cheaply because he was so famous. Who, who are your favourite writers? Um, I used to like Kingsley Amos a lot. I like the poems of Philip Larkin. I like Jonathan Coe. He's a very good writer. Kate Atkinson. David Nobbs, who wrote Reggie Perrin. A bit of Ali Smith. Um, I said Stephen King. Keith Waterhouse, who wrote Billy Liar. I'm just reading Julie Birchall's new book. Um, I used to like Ian Banks a lot. I still do like his books. Um, Neil Gaiman I like. More Jonathan Coe. Okay. Gosh, there's probably others. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's going to get me through the next couple of weeks of looking up people to read. Um... B.S. Johnson. B.S. Johnson's great. I met Jonathan Coe because we were both doing a B.S. Johnson event in a pub. B.S. Johnson's probably massively underrated. Brahms and Simon, look them up. They're the strangest comedy writers of all time. Carol Brahms and S.J. Simon. You wrote for Brass Eye. Yes. And uh, the Brass Eye special got a fair amount of, uh, should we say, negative press. Somewhat. Yeah. Did you? Were you negatively affected by that? Did that have a? Were you like sent any death threats or anything mad like that, or was that a? No, I was I was positively affected because although I believe me and Jane Busman were named and shamed in the Daily Mail or something, I didn't see it. I think we had our names printed 
and allegedly our addresses, but I never saw it. In actual fact, for the next 10 years, people will just come up and say, I understand you wrote on that. What a great program. We actually, according to Chris Morris, Jane and I actually had no jokes in the show, made the cut. We dispute that, but he put our names on it, on the credits as a thank you, which was really nice, though we think we had stuff on it. Um, the reason it got so much controversy is that the first time it went out, hardly anybody watched it. And Channel 4 thought it would be fun to repeat it just before the first edition of Big Brother, which meant that millions of people who never watched Channel 4 turned in to see a show about pedos and got very upset. Yeah, that that sounds a, a little bit like how I'd imagine Channel 4 would schedule their thing, because it, se- it feels like sometimes you're watching you know, like a nice documentary, and then all of a sudden there's some sort of adult film on late at night, and then there's some sort of gambling show, and then, the, you know what I mean? It's... um. It's a bit random. Yeah. What What is the favorite, your favorite show or radio series or joke that you've ever written or been involved with? Well, the one at the moment, which is online, is Malcolm Tucker talking to Chris Addison about Star Wars, which if you Google Malcolm Tucker Star Wars will come up. It's very sweary. It's in the thick of it. I'm very proud of that. Just slightly going back to self-publishing, do you think... Because there are a lot of means now for people to get their stuff out there, like podcasting or YouTube. Do you think it's a good way to be discovered as a as a writer or performer, or do you think these they're, they're becoming a bit saturated? Um, I think it's been saturated for about five years now. I think if you can break through it, you know, sometimes it just makes people work harder. Sometimes would be my argument. So yeah, it's saturated, but it's been saturated for years. And there's not much else you can do apart from go round door to door banging on people's windows. You're someone with an agent and with a, a very strong writing CV. So obviously for you, I'd imagine uh, there are opportunities at big production companies or at um, grassroots levels of new production companies that your friends have started maybe or people that you're acquaintances with. How would you say opportunities look? When, you, when you're sat around a writing table, for example... At a, at a, or, you know, when you are, oh, because you said sometimes you work from home, or often you work from home. Mm-hmm. Um, how often do you see a new face at a writing table? And is that because you're work? Is, is, if you don't, is that because you're working with friends? Or hang on, that's a good question. Um, not that often. Um, but I would say every time I do a series, I probably see two new people. But again, it's hard to tell because I really try not to go to any meetings. Um, it's a slow process. A lot of uh, people at my level um, find it, uh, I, they say frustrating to get into production companies and, and writing groups and that kind of thing, but when you when you get into it sometimes conversationally with them, like what they've done, it feels like they've been hit once and then knocked back and then they're sort of waiting six months to do it again, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. rather than chasing it again. Um, what advice would you give to someone to stay motivated to keep, you know, trying and getting the, their scripts out there or, or trying and getting paid work in from different areas? My advice would be to stop for a bit, just to step back, not get too intense about it. Do something else for a while. Do maybe do what you're already doing for money, but just not to get too hung up on it, you know. Just stop banging on that door to maybe try, if you want to be a writer, try writing something different for a while. If you want to be a performer, try a different kind of performing. But, you know, the only answer in the end is keep going. It doesn't really matter. Put it this way, I'm not interested to be blunt. Nobody cares about your sob story. Keep going. And if you don't make it, then either you were unlucky or you were no good. But generally, if you keep going, you will. that would be my advice. Generally, if you keep going, you will make it. If only so people want you to shut up. Is there a particular piece of work or like a project that you turn down that you regret doing so, or by that same token, like in the reverse, are there any that you regret getting involved with? I'm not going to mention any I regret getting involved with. Once I was out at a party and Graham Linehan of Father Ted and the IT crowd, fame before he did all that, asked me if I fancied writing something with him. And I had lots of people I didn't know asking me to write with them. So I said, no, I don't regret that, but it would have been nice. And yes, so that's that. What was that show? Did that show end up being a show? No, okay. that was just a conversation. Okay. Um, you've written a Doctor Who show, um, and 
um, a lot of comedy writers have done that as well. How close would you say the genres of comedy and sci-fi are, and do you think they're getting closer together? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, it's weird because science fiction used to be quite humorless because the problem was it was so absurd that you couldn't subvert it. And when there was enough science fiction to take the mickey out of, people like Douglas Adams started to take the mickey out of it. <laughs> and I really think that's what happened. Because the thing about comedy is that it's non comedy is completely parasitic. There's very few exceptions I can think of, but comedy is mostly taking the mickey out of stuff parodying it, pastiching it, laughing at things. It's very hard to create an original edifice. And what was great about someone like Douglas Adams was that he clearly loved science fiction. He wrote Doctor Who, proper Doctor Who. And yet at the same time, he was able to send it up. And also, comedies are great. comedy and science fiction have the imagination thing in common. So science fiction should be very imaginative, and so is comedy. So they go together. And certainly in the world of comics, the two have really combined. You get a lot of very funny comics. Don't ask me being what they are, science fiction and so forth. I have myself written a comic called That's Because You're a Robot, which is satirical. No, it's not. Which is comedy and science fiction. As to whether they're getting closer, um, I think they always will. It'll always bubble under. But, you know, the moment you have the thing, the Hollywood, the Hollywood vibe for science fiction is basically big, awe-inspiring space bollocks. So I think on a cheaper level... There's loads of films, none of whom whose names I can remember. But I think you'll find a lot of low-budget science fiction is really funny, and a lot of high-budget science fiction isn't. That film Gravity, which was stinking crap, was the least funny film I've ever seen. Is, is there a reason why you don't uh, see more writers attempting to... So, like, more new writers attempting to merge the two? Do you think, you know, p people like Douglas Adams have done it so well that, you know, it's it's... People, people think that they're, they're going to, when they think that genre, they're going to think him. So as a result, there's, there's not a niche area for them to go into with that? Or The thing is, partly that for a long time, TV were writers, people wanting to write in television were told, you can't write a historical show because we have Blackadder, and you can't write a science fiction one because we have Red Dwarf. And that's changed a little. The other thing is science fiction was traditionally very expensive, because you had to build a lot of sets, build a lot of costumes and so on. Things are changing. And the success of shows like Utopia, which aren't really quite science fiction, but are, I think there'll be more, more science fiction as it gets easier. And whenever science fiction is popular, whenever there's a big hit, Star Wars, for example, spawned an awful lot of science fiction telly, which meant an awful lot of science fiction comedy. So... People have put off science fiction for expense reasons and also because of the belief that it's niche. You know, you don't see a lot of science fiction sitcoms because TV commissioners think no one likes science fiction. Whereas, you know, a show like Red Dwarf, which I wasn't a fan of, proved that you just set a sitcom in space and people go with it. I, f I find niche things are actually less of a risk than the non-risky stuff, if that mm. makes sense. Because there's too many people doing the non-risky stuff. And as a result, you put yourself into a more diluted market. Oh yeah, there are things niche things always stand out more, but there's always there is always the risk. You know, TV commissioners do have a slight point. Um, bland shows are useful for people. People just sometimes want to sit down and watch some slop for an hour. Well, then again, you get shows like Miranda or Mrs. Brown's Boys, neither of which I'm a fan of. They're niche in a way because nobody ever thought of having an Irish panto show with swearing in. What TV shows do you watch? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, I used to like Game of Thrones. I like a bit of Seinfeld and Modern Family. If I can, I've just been not really watching a lot of telly other than children's television at the moment and nature programmes, but almost all, almost all American sitcoms are great. Almost no British sitcoms are great. <laughs> the IT crowd's really good. I really like Count Arthur Strong. Um, yeah, that's pretty much sums it up. Okay, your your Doctor Who episode, um, you you wrote the whole thing in its entirety, as I yeah, understand. Yeah, it's an audio episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Was that just through your agent, or did you have an idea and you sent it in, and they were like, "We'll get back to you," and then they sort of had a slot and they picked you because they knew you could write it because you'd written something before. 
I think it's the second one. Yeah, I can't remember now. I just remember going going to meet someone in a bar and talking about it, and them saying, "These are the, which Doctor Who do you want to write for? You can't have A, B, or C actor." And then I wrote it, and yeah. Okay. Um, without getting too specific, um, because well, unless you want to, that's your choice. Um, can you make a living writing through radio? Um, yes, you can if you write on, if you either write loads and loads of shows or if you write on a big show. Of course, it depends what you mean by living. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can just you can do it. You can do it. You just have to be regular, but it's bloody hard. I would advise not doing it. Not not writing as in not trying to make a living writing for radio or not trying to make a living from it. Do other things as well as. Yes. Okay. Um, and for people, I mean, because you said that the production times are, are, long, are longer for TV than for radio. As, as a result, I know a lot of people are putting their stuff up online so they can prove it is worth a TV production company, you know, sort of looking into it. Because obviously if you can prove that there's X number of people that have watched it and love it, they'll hopefully, you know, take note more than just a script, if that makes sense. <laughs> What advice would you give? So, say someone had a, a radio script, would you say it's a good idea for them to make it and prove it has a uh, audience, or would you say it's a better idea to send in a script? Um, the best thing to do is neither of those. The best thing to do, if you've got a radio idea, um, you should approach a radio production company because this is a truism. BBC producers don't really care if they make a program or not because they get paid anyway. And because they'll be making a program whether you see them or not. Independent producers, however, go bust if they do not make any programs. They have a vested interest in making your show. So I would say try that first. Then put it online if nobody wants it. Or if nobody wants it, maybe think about why nobody wants it. Do you uh, have any thoughts or agree with the sentiment that uh, Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross's radio incident has had... Um, a negative impact on challenging comedy on BBC Radio? I think it's had a negative impact on every aspect of radio. Um, I like Jonathan Ross. Uh, not on this instance. I don't have any views about Russell Brand, really. I thought, owing to an unfortunate series of circumstances, that went out. People that I knew slightly lost their jobs. People who were talented lost their jobs. Um, the BBC became scared, obsessively scared, and buckled under. I thought well, a lot of people think that they should have ignored it, said, yeah, a mistake was made, let's move on, like people normally do with apologies. I think radio still hasn't recovered from that in challenging and vaguely challenging comedy. Um, yeah, I thought it was a real low point, and it's made a lot of mess for people. And, uh, yeah, to be honest, I disrespect Russell Brown quite severely for that, also making menstruation gags grow up, you wanker. He, to be fair, he was doing that for ten. I mean, like we shouldn't have expected anything more or less from him. He was doing that for a decade before. Was he? I've, I've never heard him before. Um, so yeah, God, he was on the radio. No, I thought he was just there to play records and have a beard. <laughs> um, no, unfortunately not. And I mean, now he's he's uh, trying to save the world. Well, yeah, you grow a beard, you think you're the Messiah. That's generally what happens. No, I don't. I don't care for him. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, do you do you think as a direct result or maybe not as a direct result just as a result of the internet having such a impact on on performers and and writers having their own outlet for their own work the quality of shows on bbc tv or in general has has gone down or has significantly changed i'm sorry could you say that again so given that the internet has allowed writers and performers and uh, maybe even actors to put up their own scripts and uh, sitcoms and shows for free or for very little money. Do you think it's um, stopped the level of creativity going through, which has had an impact on the overall uh, level of writing? Because you were talking earlier about um, how there are some channels that are pretty much just you know qu quiz shows and and um panel shows do you think if the internet or there was less uh availability online for people to share their stuff they would 
go through to different TV channels to get their word out and therefore there'll be more creativity on those channels? Or do you think it would carry on the way that it has done because those shows are very cheap to make? I honestly don't know. You wrote a sitcom for the internet specifically. Yes. And uh, you went from idea to production to distribution all the way through. So I guess what I'm asking is, when, when you were originally sitting down with that idea and you mm. said you know, with your, with your group of people that, you know, had obviously volunteered their time and you've obviously got a little bit of financing, but not the amount, as you pointed out, that you would normally have for a show like that. What, what, what was your thought process around taking it? Because you, obviously you, you'd had experience in writing up to that point, but the production element of it, again, you'd had some experience, but then distributing it. I mean, I, I imagine you learnt quite a lot in terms of the additional bits of jobs that get done for you maybe by production houses okay sorry i'll cut you off um yes basically what you do when you've got a new idea like that is you should explore every if you're doing it yourself you should find out how it's done when we did the junkies we got in a producer called jess search and she knew there was an organization called shooting people who basically it's a it's a notice board if you if you're a cameraman if you're an engineer if you're a sound recorder or a lighting person you say you're available for work, and then she just went to shooting people, assembled people who'd be interested, got a director. And, yeah, we learned as we went along. For example, while we tried to spend no money at all, we discovered that we couldn't film without insurance. You know, we'd say to ourselves, oh, we don't need insurance. No one will fall over. But they said, you just can't do it. So, essentially, I would just say, especially nowadays with the Internet being what it is, find out as much information as you can before you go in, because it'll create fewer problems later as for things like and just ask around find out from people who've done it themselves you're absolutely right ask as many questions as possible because their questions don't cost anything but money does you have often written with a similar or you've written with groups of writers on and off with different projects mm. what are your thoughts on collaborations and and continual collaborations in terms of uh, both creativity and working in working relationships it really varies from people to people i get frustrated working with people because i work at a certain speed um but other people are more thorough one of the things i learned about collaborations is it generally helps if you are different to your collaborator there's no point two of you being really good at jokes or really good at stories Clement and Lafrenet, who wrote Porridge, who wrote The Likely Lads, who were Ophida's own who were brilliant writers. Allegedly, one of them is very good at writing plots, one of them is very good at being funny. And because they don't cross over, they get on. That's the other thing about collaboration, you have to get on with people. And it can be very annoying being locked in a room with them. You can also get on too well with people. I really hate it when you read about comedians who just sit around laughing at each other's gags all day. It just seems a bit weird. And the final thing is that if you write with somebody else, you split the money. Um, oh, and the other final thing is it takes longer to collaborate. If I was working with you and we were talking about a joke, we'd have to talk about it. Whereas if you had an idea for a joke, you could just write it. It swings and roundabouts, really. Um, I like writing on my own, so that's why I do it. But I've had really good times working with people. So it just depends on how you feel. But you'll make more money if you do it on your own. Do you find, uh, because it's your preference to write on your own, you maybe have limited your, um, I don't want to say opportunities, because as we discussed before, limiting stuff can often be quite good. But if they, for example, really want people to work in teams, I assume, I mean, you've done it before, but would you ever sort of say, no, I want to, if I was going to write for that, I'd, I'd want to write on my own. Do you ever like completely stick to your guns? It hasn't come up, to be honest. I worked in a team on TV Burp, and I work in a team on Veep, and those are the things I've most recently done. Um, it depends on the thing, but it's very hard to say no to people. Okay. All right. Uh, well, that is, that's everything. That's all the questions. Thank you very much. That was fun. I enjoyed that. That was David. I had a lovely time talking to him. Honestly, it was really exciting and really interesting to talk to someone who had written for so many TV shows that I've watched and loved over the years. And I, re I just really enjoyed learning like from him and getting inspiration for stuff that I want to do. It was really nice of him to give up his time like that. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to find him on any social media site, 
in the show notes or you can google it if you don't want to look at it there he's all over the place keep your eye out for his for his book the mule and also he's got that book out next year on how to be a writer which i think i'll be getting a copy of because that that does sound really up my street on a more personal note i just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has donated towards the podcast so far i was a bit worried i put a I put a PayPal button on the website, which is arseindustrypodcast.tumblr.com, so that if you wanted to, you could give me a pound or two per podcast, whatever you think it's worth. Uh, you don't have to. They're free. It's absolutely fine. Uh, it's just really helpful if you do do it. Um, if, if you don't have the money or you can't do it, I'm still going to make them. It's not going to change. But it is blooming useful to have a little bit of money coming in. So uh, thank you so much to everyone who's donated. Um, I'm going to attempt to start messaging people personally and thanking them if you like this and you'd like some more please remember to subscribe or share it with a friend or rate it on itunes all three things help out the show the next episode which should be out in about a week's time will be with louisa omelan she had the sleeper hit of 2012 at the edinburgh fringe with uh, what would beyonce do and has carried on that buzz and success through into 2013, and then with her follow-up show, Am I Right Ladies, with just as much success. She was on the free fringe for both, and had sell-out shows every night. I went there about three times and couldn't get in, and had to <laughs> like sort of get there early and get favours in, and do everything I could to try and see her at the fringe, which is where I wanted to watch it. She's also done runs at Soho Theatre and Leicester Square Theatre, uh, which all sold out as well. So I've got her on to talk about uh, marketing, PR, the value of social media, and connecting and finding your audience. So that should be a really interesting one. Uh, if you're interested in getting that podcast, feel free to subscribe, and it will be in your inbox in about a week and a half's time. Speak to you soon. Bye.